Hi, uh, this is the old man at a fly rod, and um, today I'm just going to bring you some more stuff. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you, I moved down here about 18 months ago to southern Missouri. Uh, actually, I live in Hollister, right off of Lake Tanicomo. And Lake Tanicomo is a widening of the White River here that um, runs all the way into Arkansas, and uh, it's well stocked um, with trout. But uh, the trout um, do very, very well. In fact, every once in a while you catch uh, a natural that was not stocked. And um, <clears throat> so I have a ton of fun fishing here. Uh, most of my fly fishing before moving here 18 months ago was uh, smallmouth bass fishing in uh, Wisconsin or uh, fly fishing with my uh, wife's cousin up in Montana at least once or twice a year. And, uh, but then when I moved down here, I was all excited and I've probably done more fly fishing here than I have in my whole life in these 18 months and having a ton of fun of it. Uh, also, uh, tying flies is just, you know, a byproduct of fly fishing. You just enjoy it so much. I'm not a very exquisite fly tire. Um, I'll tie some nymphs and I'll tie some mega worms and some woolly buggers, but uh, I have fun, you know. And that's what uh, the retirement has brought me besides um, my, my love for the Lord and doing whatever he has for me to do too, which has been just marvelous and fun. Um, today we're gonna be looking at a mega worm. I, when I did move down here, I didn't know anything and I went out the first few times and I'm catching nothing on sow bugs, flashback pheasant tails, whatever. And nothing was happening, so I went ahead and um, I went to the fly shop, which I highly recommend if you move to a new area, support your local fly shop because uh, they are a wealth of information and they were generous with their information at Anglers Outfitters uh, right here in Branson. And uh, they have a whiteboard in their shop and the whiteboard uh, gives you uh, an idea of what the guides are catching fish on that day. And so I looked at the whiteboard, and uh, here was a white mega worm that they were slaying them on. I thought, what's a white mega worm? So I, in the fly shop, I went to their bins, and I saw some uh, mega worms, as they were titled. And I bought one, and then I proceeded to catch my first fish. And in fact, it wasn't about a month later in September that I caught a nice 20-inch rainbow that was the delight of my life at that particular time. I think the largest one I've caught down here now since then is 23 inches. Uh, brown, I think it was, I caught that with that. But uh, the white mega worm got me started, and uh, even to this day, I uh, fish it quite often, uh, but there has to be a chop on the water, and there has to be a bit of a current. Now, if there's a chop on the water, I think it does two things for the fish. Number one, it disperses light such that uh, the fish can't really recognize what's at water level or above and don't get as spooked. That's number one, which means your uh, strike indicator isn't going to spook them as much. Uh, the second thing it does, it uh, provides a little bit more movement to your fly that's down below your strike indicator with the chop on the water. In fact, I used to get upset when boats went by. I didn't know. Goodness, they're just going to chase the fish away. But what happened is in the wake of the boat, my strike indicator would really go up and down. And you can imagine what's happening to the fly down below. If I have a midge, it looks like it's emerging and trying to emerge. And you can't believe how many fish uh, I catch in the wake of a boat going by. So don't get discouraged if a boat goes by. You actually kind of praise the Lord. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and tie this uh, my, my white mega worm today and uh, like I said I fish it with a chop and a little bit of a current uh, the current makes it look more natural as it does all the other flies rather than just sitting there and uh, if I have it just sitting there in still water uh, with no generators running out of the dam I don't have hardly at all the success that I do when I have a chop and a good current so let's take a look at this fly together it's take me 10 minutes to uh, time one and we'll go from there. Okay, let's get started on tying this uh, white mega worm. Like I said, it only take about 10 minutes to do. 
But um, what we're going to start with is a 172nd ounce, uh, 72nd ounce, right? Um, a jig head. And um, the way I, of course, I get the white head is I just go ahead and I take it when it first comes to me, <clears throat> just a plain old uh, lead head, is I will go ahead, open this up, and I'll take a pair of long nose pliers, and I will just uh, dip it into this outdoor uh, acrylic paint. And I have found this stuff to hold up longer than I do the fly, so, um, just, uh, you'll find this at Hobby Lobby, yeah. And uh, so once you dip, once I dip it, then I go ahead, after I dip it in the uh, paint, I just go ahead and I put it on a piece of styrofoam. And the eye of the hook keeps it away from the styrofoam so that the uh, paint on the head stays on there. And that's how I get my white-headed um, jig heads to start with, a 172nd ounce. A jig head works best. So now I'm going to go ahead and put on a little um, white underbody with some uh, white thread and we'll just get that going here. I don't want the color of the hook showing so I'm going to go ahead and go across this a couple times just to have a nice underbody under here. And I'll probably take it all the way to the gap of the hook. And there we go. And then I'll come back and give it a little bit of thickness. Not a big deal. But I do want to hide the metal of the hook from the fish's eye. So there we go. That's pretty much good enough. Okay, now, as you all know, who watched uh, previous videos of mine, I just like to use a razor blade to cut off the excess, and I just cut the whole wire, of course. That's the dis, dis, um, <clears throat> the problem with using a razor blade. And we'll go ahead back now and, and take the razor blade and cut that in one more time. Good. There we go. I'm having more trouble today than I normally do. I just usually cut that off, and it's a done deal. There we go. I, you know what? <clears throat> I, my uh, grandson helps me uh, edit these videos, and when you watch them, you wonder, gosh, that guy's so clumsy. I wonder if he even edits it. But I talked to my grandson, and he says, you know what, people would rather see your mistakes and how you correct them and what's going on and how, with the Lord's help, you don't get frustrated. <laughs> so that was a perfect example. Usually I take that razor blade and just cuts it off really nice for me without scissors. Okay, so now <clears throat> this um, is your white mega worm material. And um, it comes in huge uh, skeins of... Uh, <laughs> About the size of my head, I got this stuff from Michael's. It's made for baby blankets, and uh, I've got enough here to last me a couple of lifetimes, uh, though I expect only one here on this earth. So now uh, I just cut off a piece as long as what I need, and I'm going to go ahead and tie this on. But if I tie it right on, this stuff tends to pull apart. So I'm going to go ahead and take a uh, lighter and just uh, singe the end a little bit. There we go. And now I'll go ahead and just tie that on. And I pinch it a little bit and I pinch the thread a little bit. And that gives me a nice uh, firm hold on this uh, Mega Worm material. Okay. And uh, let's go ahead and put in a couple half hitches in case I make another mistake. And uh, we don't want to lose the whole problem process here. There we go. There we go. So what did the fish say when he ran into the 
cement wall. Damn. Okay, so that's about how far I want that. I'm going to cut this off. I'm, I'm probably going to estimate how much I need by doubling it over from the end of the hook to the front of the hook and maybe give it a little excess, extra I should say, because of the fact that I'm going to singe it. And so let's go ahead and just cut that off right there. Yeah, that's even a little bit too much. So let's just cut off a little bit more. Good deal. Let's singe it before it does start coming apart. There we go. Good. And that's good. That's really great. Okay. <clears throat> if this tail is too long, when you're fishing it, it gets uh, wrapped around inside the gap of the hook and it's not attractive to the fish at all. So you really want that tail to either go upwards or not be too long. Um, so anyway, what I'm going to do now is put a little super glue uh, right on the uh, shank of the hook that's been covered with my white thread. And um, let's just make sure my super glue is nice and open. There we go. And then I'm going to go ahead and drop a little bit on there. And then I'm just going to wipe it on the top, on the bottom a little bit. Go right up to the junction there. Good. And now what I'll do is I will take the Mega Worm material and try and not get my hands on the super glue. I'll just go ahead and for about 20 seconds, wrap it around the body best I can and hold it there. Um, boy, I had one on the other day. I actually caught it. It was only about, you know, 14 inch rainbow and it just annihilated this mega worm material. Usually it's pretty sturdy, especially if you singe both ends. It's pretty sturdy fly, but uh, these are so easy and inexpensive to tie that um, I, I don't care that much. I'm going to take my, uh, well, I better, I, you know what, I better uh, whip finish this because we're going to put a little uh, red collar on it. So let's go ahead and show you how terrible I am at whip finishing, but we'll have fun. One, two, three, take that out of there, and there we go. All right, and now we'll cut that excess off. All right, and, you know, I usually have a second light on this, but uh, I found this white material. If I have too much light, it just comes back to the camera, just really blurred. So I'm uh, doing it with just this one. Now let me just see what you're seeing. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I want. Uh, I still think this may be a little bit too long, so I'm going to cut off a little bit more material here. Yes, and maybe just a touch more. Singe it again. And there you go. Now, the other day I was fishing one of these, and man, they were really tuned in to this particular fly that day. We call it a white bite down here in uh, Southern Missouri. And they were really gobbling this sucker up. And um, uh, I, f I found that um, even though they were taking this stuff off, they were just so hungry for this particular fly that even though I had to cut it shorter because my fly, my material was getting caught in the gap of the hook as I was casting it, I cut it off a little shorter and um, then it wasn't getting caught and I was catching a lot of fish. The only problem is I didn't have a lighter with me to singe the end. And so uh, the fish were just kind of, you know, little by little <laughs> just destroying that fly. Didn't seem to stop them though. In fact, I was quite surprised on how well the material did hold up. But every other fly tire I watch make one of these, they uh, are pretty uh, concerned that the fish is going to just annihilate the end of this material by just pulling it all apart. So that's why we singe it. 
Now this is a, pr a pretty good looking fly. We're ready to go. I put a little cement on there and we're all done. However, there is uh, one last thing and that is I always like to tie in a little bit of um, red f a flashy crystal type um, thread. I've got this I think at Michael's also. It's really sparkly stuff and so I cut off an end about so big and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, wrap that around there. You know what I think I'll do? I'll use a uh, hackle pliers and keep a hold on this. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll put a piece of hackle, um, hackle pliers holding that like so and now I can go ahead and uh, just tie this on to give it a little bit of flash on that neck area. I am real happy with this stuff. It really makes that thing look spot on. And you're saying, Tom, you didn't leave enough room for um, to uh, uh, whip finish. And you're right. So what we're going to do, and I always do anyway, is I'm just going to put a little bit of super glue right on that spot and let it run down the head to my thread and that'll soak right in. <laughs> so you're probably wondering why I tie this red collar onto this mega worm. In fact, they call it a daredevil mega worm at the beginning of this video. And the reason being is, <laughs> I remember, you know, I remember I'm 77 years old. And uh, I remember as a kid, the, the lure to catch bass in Northern Pike on up in Wisconsin was called a daredevil lure. And it had, it was a spoon shaped uh, lure, you know, in other words, it was oval shaped, probably an inch and a half, depending on the size of the lure too. You had choices, but uh, there was a red stripes and there were white stripes uh, the, along the length of it. And um, so people uh, would fish that and it was extremely effective on the fish up there. So you have to remember that um, I am pretty much tied to red somewhere on my flies if I can. And this has worked out well. I used to use strictly a white mega worm, but then when I started putting on this somewhat of a red collar, now I use that sparkly thread, but I think if you just put a red thread on there, it's gonna be just as effective. Uh, just build it up so it looks nice and symmetrical. Uh, some of my first ones, I didn't build it up enough and it, it, it just didn't uh, flow nicely from the head of the fly to the tail. But um, yeah, that's about uh, all I wanna show you on this. I do have a story on spoons for those that wanna stick around. Uh, it take me about five minutes, but my wife and I went down to Peru, South America back in our, uh, when we were in our late 20s, which would be in the 70s <clears throat> and um, early 70s. And we went down to uh, Peru, South America with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And uh, I'd get flown out to different tribes and uh, I would do dentistry on them, almost always extractions, because even if they came to my office uh, here in the States, the teeth were so bad, I still would have had to extract them. And so I would just uh, not extract all their teeth, but the ones that were hurting them and causing them pain. Um, and it'd be a lot of teeth just floating in pus. And I would, what I would do is I would numb uh, four people in a row that were in line. And by the time I was done numbing the fourth one, the first one was ready to go. And I would do four at a time like that from about 8.30 in the morning and sometimes till 8.30 at night. But I was a youngster and uh, yeah, I was excited and it was fun. But I'll tell you one thing, uh, we were near the Shipibo tribe uh, this one time and the Shipibo tribe had a couple of lakes in the jungle that were known for Tucanati bass. Now, Tucanati is uh, the Peruvian name for a peacock bass. It has a beautiful, gosh, uh, peacock colored uh, circle in its tail. And they run 
three to five to uh, six, seven pounds. Beautiful bass. Oh my gosh, the fight they gave you. But they love Johnson spoons. Now, you know, you just don't run to the uh, uh, bait store there and say, hey, can I buy some Johnson spoons? We just happened to bring some along. And um, uh, they were very effective on catching these. The only problem was that sometimes you'd be fighting a bass and then uh, the piranha would see the glisten of the monofilament line and snap at it and there you'd be in the middle of a fight with a Tucanati and all of a sudden, boop, nothing. It was because of the piranha biting the uh, line. One lesson I learned in life, which I'd like to share you in that experience, is there was a young man that came down and he was down there for just a couple of years and uh, as a short-term assistant, as was I actually, and uh, he loved the fish. He was from Michigan, I believe. And so we would go into the jungle there, ride uh, motorcycles on dirt paths back to the lake. And then there were uh, dugout canoes that uh, the indigenous people would have in the various parts of the jungle. And we would pay them a couple solis or they'd insist that we borrow them. Either way, we'd have a dugout canoe. And they were very stable things, but again, I was younger. And uh, so he and I took off. He was in the bow of this thing and I was in the stern. And we we're fishing with these... Uh, uh, Johnson spoons and uh, he couldn't believe it and he gets into one and I'm gonna tell you he had a fight of his life and it was such a heavy fish it was pulling us around on the lake of course the canoe was just a little dugout thing so it wasn't a big deal and it's pulling us around pulling us around he's having the fight of his life in the middle of fighting that fish he looked up to the sky and said Thank you, Lord, for good times. I haven't forgotten that line in 50 years uh, since hearing that. And it was a great lesson for me. And I just pass it on to you. Take it uh, however you want. And as we are so used to calling on God when we have troubles, have problems, uh, projected needs that we have, we go to God with those things. But how often do we go to God in times of joy and say, thank you, Lord, for the good times. Father, as I sit here at this Christmas and I'm looking at the, all my kids and grandkids around me, thank you for the good times. Um, there are many moments that uh, we have times to be thankful and uh, just to express it to him as you, as you would a good friend. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, hey, good luck with that uh, white mega worm, okay? Talk to you later. Bye.